a useful innovation to fund independent journalism. So this is about money as a tool for democracy. We have an excellent panel today, uh, first time as far as I remember at this festival that uh, we have a panel of uh, funders which are not only looking for profit but want to do good for democracy. And um, I have on my right, first of all, Kirsti Loken Stavrum, CEO of the Tinius Trust from Norway. Uh, then further on my right, Adrian Arena, the director for international human rights of the Oak Foundation, uh, both uh, very um, potent funders of free and democratic media. On my left, I have Beata Balogova, editor-in-chief of SME in the Slovak Republic, a recipient of funding of the Media Development Investment Fund, which is represented on this panel uh, to my left by Patrick Schneider, Patrice Schneider, the Chief Strategy Officer uh, of this fund. Democracy is in crisis for many reasons. There are governments who put their hands on media, uh, but there are also tycoons who put their hands on media. Democracy needs a public space which functions for democracy. And an important element of this public space are free media journalists who can work freely, who have a commitment to the truth and can work for the truth without having to fear either government or private power. So it is very important to discuss the material basis for this important function in democracy, the material economic basis for the public space. And that's what we will be doing today. And it is very important to keep in mind that a plurality of actors in the media space must be accompanied by a plurality of forms and a plurality of funding. Because only this plurality in total together secures uh, freedom. So uh, the European model certainly is that we have, wherever possible, a mixed media space composed of players who are completely funded publicly or in part funded publicly. East, um, Italy is a case in point where the printed press receives substantial public support and of course a very important role of private funders which um, are a counterbalance, an important counterbalance um, in particular in countries where the government funded media is not independent. But all of this is not enough. It is important also to have mixed forms of funding because certain forms of private funding on their own create new dependencies. And that's what we will hear about first. Namely, what is the difference between being in the hands of an oligarch and being funded by a mixed instrument, in this case, the Media Development Investment Fund. So for this perspective, I would first like to give uh, the uh, word to Beata Balogova. Please, Beata, you have the word. Thank you. I'm a survivor, a survivor of a unwanted media marriage, just like many other colleagues in Czech Republic, Hungary, Bulgaria, Romania, and Poland. And that media marriage really harmed uh, one of the symbols of independent press in Slovakia, Daily Sme. We were really the newspaper which survived Vladimir Mečiar, that's the guy who pushed uh, Slovakia to the verge of international isolation. And Slovakia earned the description of black hole by Madeleine Albright. And we survived that. And when we thought that we are on the right track, then German investors started withdrawing from the region and Penta, uh, and they asked for a price which only Penta was willing to pay. Shortly after, and Penta is a very toxic investor, uh, it is indicated in one of the biggest corruption scandals in the, in the country. And shortly after Penta bought its share in 2014, 
uh, one of the co-owners made a public uh, announcement that they look at the investment as an atomic suitcase, which really meant that a confirmation that they are buying media to feel more secure, to uh, scare off any critique, be it a journalist or, let's say, pro prosecution or, or police. And uh, that's how it started, but it, it, it really never ended because the bad reputation of the financial group uh, hit very hard the, the whole publishing house. Partly, a large part of the newsroom left, and they established a new independent uh, daily, Jenniken, which ended up a positive story, but I want, don't want to rush ahead. But we who stayed, we had really difficult time to hire good journalists, and some of the journalists who applied, they were in, in contact with Penta, and I assumed that if uh, we hired them, they would be really from inside the newsroom working for, for Penta. Penta is a big investor. They, they are very active in healthcare, meat processing, in banking. So for us, it meant that indirectly, we were instantly in conflict of interest. And the, the, they, as, as investor, were always in conflict of interest. So for my reporters, it meant that you could not possibly write uh, from healthcare a story which at some point did not knock at Penta. And Penta really often responded, they disliked the way we covered the, the sector. And because we, we had our integrity, for Penta it meant that we were even more critical of the investment group than any other news publication or, or the Dienik and Also, just to share some, some of the little details how they looked at their investment, that uh, whenever we wrote something that they disliked, they contacted the publisher, Alexei Fulmak, who really protected the newsroom. So that was our good luck that we had a traditional investor. And traditional media investors who actually understand journalism are dying out. That's really a bad news. And they are being replaced by uh, commercial investors who really look at their investment completely in a different way. But for example, regarding the healthcare stories, once Penta did a survey and they counted the stories by number, how many stories we wrote about healthcare, and they categorized the stories as positive, negative, and neutral. And it turned out that, you know, for them, any critical story was a, a negative story. And they were trying to put a pressure on me to penalize the author of, of these stories. Then the bad reputation also hit back in a way that it gave some munition to ammunition to former Prime Minister Robert Fitzo, who since then turned out that was the head of the mafia state and, and uh, he infiltrated, his people infiltrated the police and prosecution. But they often attacked us when we wrote a critical story about his government and the way they function, he would say that, oh, but that's a penta child, or, you know, he, he called me a penta woman. And, and it really showed that, that we had to deal with penta every day. Even though they did not influence us, we had to think about them. Then the turn came when uh, Pluralis, the, the Media Investment and Development Fund, invested into the newspaper. And just to describe the difference, I, I will use a small anecdote. Uh, the new investor, the only time they cared about content was when they asked me to provide a list of stories I feel the most proud about. And uh, under Penta, this could never really happen. Also, the understanding of managerial approach is, is completely business-driven. It's almost like you know, they are running a meat factory and, and counting how many tins of processed meat we, we produce. And so I, I really have a direct experience how important it is to have people who understand the importance of journalism, who understand how journalists think and work, how important their integrity is, because once, they, once you take away the integrity from, from the journalist, 
then that person crosses the line and loses the self-esteem, and that's when the person really can become part of the massive propaganda machine that happened massively in Hungary, where, uh, of course, it's not an, an one particular investment group, but the experience is very similar. Thank you, uh, Beata. Now, um, over to uh, Patrice, who will explain to us what is so special about this mixed financing. I hear, um, in contrast to what Beata says, that actually this fund is also asking for some return of investment, not just the great stories. So let's hear how <coughs> such a mixed financing, which is still a little bit business oriented uh, and challenges you to be a viable <laughs> media company, uh, can contribute to the plurality of media and to freedom uh, uh, and the functioning of democracy in Europe. Patrice. Thank you, Paul. First of all, um, I'm, I'm always very humble when I hear stories like the one of Beata. I, I just want to underline that um, the reason uh, I work for the organization I work for and the work I do is because of the courage of people like that who not just confront the difficulties of, uh, of, of, of running a very independent media in hostile environments, but also, um, in their case, manages to push back a nasty investor inside the organization. I just want you to stop for a second and realize what the double whammy was for an organization. So I'm very humble. Thank you, Beata. Um, uh, I work for an organization that has been a little bit present in Perugia, but we are the Media Development Investment Fund. We consider ourselves a combination of a human rights organization and an investment fund, which sounds as interesting as, it's, as it is. And to l plug into the question of, um, of Paul, we've been for 27 years, we've been uh, using this theory of change that if you are financially viable, as Paul said, you will be editorially independent, and if you are editorially independent, you will have an impact on your society. It's the most simplest theory of change, as the word goes, but that's what we do. Now, to this blended structure, we operate around the world, but um, we were following pretty much Fukuyama's theory of the, of the world, which means that liberal democracy would spread themselves, and then we would move from former Soviet Union, from the Balkans to so former Soviet Unions, to Latin America, to Asia, Southeast Asia, and uh, Africa, which we are, but suddenly something happened. Media capture, which was so well described from the inside by, uh, by Beata in Europe. Today, uh, media capture is a phenomena in our doorsteps, on our doorsteps in Europe, where nobody can better describe than Beata the process by which media is being captured by liberal agendas or by people who simply want to control. Um, so the blended funding. MDIF was asked to look at, with their 27 year track record of investing in the most independent voices in, the, in, in countries with a media oppression um, uh, legacy, what could be done. And the idea came with this word you've heard probably increasingly, which is pluralis. Pluralis, why? Because we believe that fighting media capture, fighting a liberal agenda is not an actionable, it's not a vision. The vision is not to fight against another ideology. The vision is to maintain plurality. If in Hungary tomorrow one voice is left, or in Slovakia, thanks to Daily Sme, one voice is left to be able to say, as Orwell says, not to howl with the wolves, but say something different, perhaps pluralis could play a role, hence the name pluralis, to counter media capture, but in the object of maintaining media plurality. On the blended structure, the idea was to raise 100 million euros to be able to uh, address this concept of media capture in a very, uh, uh, and the, the concept was very simple. We would raise 100 million euros and we would buy shares using the legitimacy of MDIF of non-interfering in editorial to be able to buy shares in these organization media, independent media, at risk of being captured, or in the case of Daily Smay, already captured and de decaptured them. 100 million, we are now at 50 million. Uh, we've stopped two media capture and on the road to do a third one in the Balkans. And the blended, f this is where the fun, I think we wanted to bring to Perugia. At the beginning, we truly believe we would have two types of blend 
in this typology. We would have foundations, which are typically have funded independent media. And then we went to a um, rep reputable independent media company in Western Europe saying, this is what's happening in a way in, in your domain. Independent media is being captured. Would you provide some patient capital? And I'll come to the rate of return to do that. Um, I'm glad to say that on this panel, you'll be hearing about one foundation, which has been extremely, uh, which immediately, well, came on board and so forth, Oak Foundation with Adrian, and of course, uh, Tinius Trust, which is the foundation behind Shipstead Group, me, the media group in Norway, a very reputable independent media. But I want to extend that, that what we didn't realize that we would, once we got this, this duo, in French we say binome, of two foundations and independent, uh, so reputable independent media company, suddenly the impact capital started to say, well, we want to be part of that. So we went from a duo to a trio, which is, composes the 50 million euros we have right now. And once that was done, we went to a quatuo, as we say in music. The quatuo became the, the GLS bank. So we, had, we have now the largest ethical bank in Germany, which is issuing a bond for retail clients. People like you and me who have a bank account and an ethical bank that says, I want to participate in independent media. I want to be able to do that. So this typology is the first ever, in a way, that brings together in one vehicle a typology of different actors, of blended actors, which we thought we could share with you. Now, I'll, fi I'll finalize by the end the question of Paul, which is say, how much return do you get on investment? So, because we are, because we are a, uh, the objective is not, and we are not an investment fund, we are a tool, a vehicle to address media capture. We don't look at things the same way as an investment fund. The idea is that the structure of, of Pluralis allows people to come in and say, I'm ready to provide a grant in the capital structure. Yes, a grant in investment capital structure, and I'll et, let Adrian talk a little bit more about that. This is a total innovation. A foundation that says, I am ready to be participate to help the public discourse in Europe by providing grant. The second level is 2% return on investment. So those are pretty much media companies that come in and say, I want to preserve. Uh, I'm not going to make 5% or 10% or 20% on investment. I believe that I only want 2% for the long term. And finally, the GLS people, the people in the bank, in Germany, they will get a return of 5%. Now, you've probably mentally calculated in yourself that a mixture allows probably a way of funding independent media because it's not about only the return on investment, only about being viable, but it's also about the mission. I hope that answers your question, Paul. Thank you, Patrice. Now we turn to two um, organizations who have contributed capital uh, to hear a little bit about their vision and motivation but uh, maybe about how they help to ensure this independence of uh, this fund, which then directly invests in media. So first of all, uh, Kirsti Loken Stavrum, who I understand is both a CEO of a trust, but also has a function in business, or the trust is related to a media business. So please, Kirsti. Okay, then I have to bring you into the history of the trust. Um, I think there is no sound. On the, oh, sorry. There, okay, I'll have to bring you into the history of the, of the trust very briefly. Because our founder was one of the, uh, he inherited the bulk of shares in the media group Shipstead. <clears throat> uh, while the other uh, that inherited also their shares, they sold them when, when the company was registered uh, on the stock exchange. He kept his shares. And, uh, and uh, eventually he put it into a trust uh, so that the trust should ensure a um, sustainable economy in the media group and also quality of the media and media freedom within Shipstead. So that's our main purpose. But we also have an additional purpose and that is to, when necessary, it originally said, um, we should work for the general conditions to ensure a free press. And, uh, and the board has uh, decided that when necessary is now. And, and it doesn't really make sense uh, to be, as, as you probably know, Norway has for years now been number one on the uh, media freedom index of Reporters Without Borders, which is very nice for Norway, but it doesn't make sense to, to sort of become a last frontier uh, of media freedom. So, uh, so, um, and also, it should be said that Tinius, as his name was then, uh, in his opinion, a free press is not a poor press. A press that is poor or near bankrupt is no way free. 
so that's why you need sustainable economy in the newsroom and the, in the media house as such to ensure a true uh, and real uh, freedom. So to us, uh, it made sense to go to invest them in the pluralis or to to sort of bring money into the fund. Uh, we're not very eager on the return on investment. Investment that should be said. But, uh, but we think it's, uh, it's of vital importance that civil uh, society actors that can and that understand what, what the principle of freedom of the press is, that they uh, turn up now. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's time to sort of bring in the power and, uh, and ensure that, um, that the idea of press freedom lives on, basically. Right. Thank you. KSD, before we start uh, discussing a little bit here on the panel and with the audience, I would like to give the word uh, to Adrian Arena from the Oak Foundation. The Oak Foundation uh, being another funder of the Media Freedom Fund, or Media Development Investment Fund. And uh, please, again, what's your motivation? What uh, is driving your contribution to this capital? Thanks very much. Um, you can hear me? Yeah, that's fine. So uh, I run the human rights program at the Oak Foundation. Uh, just so that you're aware, the Oak Foundation is a family foundation, really made up of a family. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm not a member of that family. I'm one of the servants. <laughs> and uh, they, um, they're based in Geneva, Switzerland. I'm based in London. And that's where the human rights program is based. We work essentially on civil and political rights around the world. And to be totally frank, we had not really uh, funded in the past a lot of um, media. I suppose if I'm frank, you know, as you will be aware, most rich people have a certain wariness about investigative journalism for a whole bunch of reasons. And I think that... Um, <laughs> The family that I worked for had no, was no exemption to that rule at all. Um, but we are very active uh, uh, donors in some very repressive environments, including Russia, Myanmar, India, uh, various other places. And we have been longtime supporters of Russian media, largely because the human rights community was essentially completely removed from official, uh, official media, and therefore independent media was the only place where their voice could be amplified. That was the window by which suddenly our own board of trustees became sensitized to the importance of independent media. And through that, we then developed into, the, um, into a much broader portfolio. I just want to say a few words about pluralis, and that is the following, that um, it was, I just want everyone to understand that it was not an easy lift. There are many uh, legal uh, um, uh, regulatory issues about using charitable funds to fund, in fact, a commercial enterprise, which have to be worked through, and they are not insignificant. Fortunately, uh, through the help of MDIF, we, were managed, we managed to accommodate all those rules. But just to say to you that philanthropy and commercial investments are often a complicated legal mix. Uh, and um, to be frank, you can't use charitable funds to make money. And so that becomes a rather complicated uh, equation. The second thing I'd say is that what really persuaded uh, the family that I work for to uh, contribute to the fund was an argument of leverage. So as Patrice said, it's $100 million. So at the moment, it's 50 that we've raised. We've given, I think, $4.5 million so far, and that four and a half million dollars, we could go to the board of trustees and say, with our four and a half, you're getting another 45 million, that is to this project. And that was a very significant and persuasive incentive, I think, for them. The third thing I'd say, and this is in integral to the model, is that this investment fund actually is supposed to not, is supposed to support sustainable, profit-making outlets. 
Um, and on that sense, we were very uh, persuaded by MDIF's investment track record in uh, actually supporting a whole range of organizations uh, to ensure that they remained in the black and, and not in the red. Um, we are effectively, through our philanthropic grant, underwriting any potential losses that the investors will make. So those investors who are promised 2% to 5%, if the investments in the various media outlets don't make that 2% or 5%, that return will be drawn on from, in fact, our charitable grant. Now, and if it doesn't happen, that's great. That money can be used to actually make capital investments in organizations. But that is the essential part of the model. And for some charitable foundations, that's a bit of a mind you know, adjustment to say, I see, so we're actually underwriting the profits of other people. Is that what we're doing with our funds? And the answer is yes, that's what we're doing. Because what we're doing is, in fact, the broader issue is that we are leveraging this money to actually safeguard democracy and independence uh, in the press. And that is really the overarching aim of the fund. So those arguments of really uh, leverage and indeed um, using those philanthropic funds to underwrite those losses are the basis on which we, in fact, participate. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you very much, Adrian, also to share a little bit this dilemma uh, with us, which is um, that, of course, in this media world, and we have discussed this here at previous festivals, the relationship between the platform economy and the press, <coughs> two companies in the world taking 80% of the online advertising revenue, uh, and therefore a lot of the press had to close, many journalists lost their job, or has become poor. So is it a model which can scale? This is a question here to the panel. Is this the future? Is it realistic in this world where nobody wants to pay anymore for news? Is it realistic to still ask for even 2 or 3% of return? And can the, those who have received the funding actually come up with this type of um, return and thus match expectations, Beata. I think it's important that it's predictable. It's important that there are clear, clear rules. And the fact that we don't have to, on a daily basis, think about who is the co-investor. I also often hear the argument that, oh, but today there are so many foundations who are supporting journalism, and, and there are so many available funds through the EU, so how come that, that you struggle? And I had all the conversations one can possibly have with my colleagues from Hungary, there is one, and also my colleagues from Romania. And the thing is that 10 or 15 years ago, like we applied for uh, small, small grants to support investigative journalism because we had a, a stable ownership and it, it actually worked. But today, these small grants no longer work because you need to prepare the grant. I would have, if I want to go into a EU scheme of funding, I would have to hire one person to do all the, the kind of preparing the grant, do a, the accounting, do the reporting. And this is only a short-term solution. And very often, like even the small investigative grants have conditions for which you have to change the way the newsroom works. You have to add topics you don't cover that often. You have to take the person who do the daily reporting off their daily task. You have to reorganize the newsroom. And it's not the fact that we uh, don't even care about small amounts and that we only want big investments, but a lot of newsrooms, like in Hungary, no longer have the capacity. And, and they actually feel that they are becoming little machines for absorbing all kinds of funding. And it very often even involves tricking the system because if you don't trick the system, then you are not able to fulfill all the conditions. And if you as a journalist have to think about tricking the system, there is a big problem with the system. Also, I, I have to say that 
I experienced that there were funds for training journalists. I mean, in Hungary, my colleagues trained themselves to death because that was the only way they were able to access financing. And so I think that we arrived to, to really the point that if we don't re rethink the whole system and the small donors don't join into partnership, then we will we will see Hungary declining and leaving the, the democratic world forever. Okay, thank you very much. It's a demand to politics, which I think is good, you know, because politics learns uh, and can change these instruments. So the focus is on ownership. Christy, you want to say something? Well, Beata put it well also this time, I think. I think she, she, she explains very well why this is the right way to think. But... Uh, pluralis is, is basically a, a, a force of, uh, of principles go coming together that we understand mm -hmm. uh, what it is like to own a media house, uh, that, we, that the value is in the freedom. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, but you need to be, the reason why you need to be sustainable is, is, um, is how to keep the, the, the independence. I think... Um, um, some of you will still remember that the newspapers used to print money. <laughs> we used to say, at least at home, with all the advertising, things have changed. But many didn't discover that before late. And, and um, the media is in a business where you need to transform, you need to adapt. It's, it's a kind of Darwinism going on, of course. It's not the strongest, it's not the biggest, but it's the most relevant and most adaptive that will survive. And, and uh, many, many outlets have spent uh, far too long time to digitally transform. The tra digital transformation phase is over now. Now we're in a new phase with ChatGPT. Uh, so if you haven't finished uh, transforming your digital era, you're late for the new bus to, to leave. Uh, so so the, this is the reason why sustainability is, a, is of a core um, issue to, to remain relevant, to remain in business, and also to, to keep your independence. So 2%, no problem, it's a, it's a, it's a precaution. All right, thank you very much. If there are no other remarks from the podium, I will open the floor. Ah, Patrice, please. I want to add to what Beata and Kerstia said in terms of your question about scaling. I think we can discuss about financial scaling. We're at 50, as I said, and we've deployed 30 to save two um, captures. But I think there's another message about scaling, about blended funding, is that it's the message that because of all the transition that was described and the one that's coming described by Kirsty in terms of chat GPT, I think it, it, the, the message of pluralism and the blending message is that we have to go beyond just the, 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 the typical way of deployment of capital. What I really like about the idea of GLS Bank going to retail people, people like you and me, is that we, we reach out basically to the consumer. And this is not a new idea. The idea is that every one of us is responsible for the public discourse and where we live. And it doesn't have to be just one million or seven million invested into plurality, but it can be 1,000 euros that you only get around. And I think that I'm not sure we'll be able to scale. This is an innovation, as the title says, but we do believe that there's a scaling maybe of the message beyond Europe and beyond, in general, for independent media, that it has, the blending has to be not just from a certain typology of civil society, civil society, pardon me, but a broader one of them. Great, thank you very much. So I open the floor uh, for questions. Please identify yourself and uh, give us your question and contribution. Please, here on the right, the gentleman in the yellow shirt. <coughs> On? Yes. Hi, my name is uh, Eddie Stock. I'm from Are We Europe? Um, and I have a question about the kind of media organizations that this kind of blended funding model addresses. So to me, it seems that there's a couple of factors. So profitability, um, already having a built-in audience and a reach. And uh, I think that's mainly it. Uh, and maybe urgent in terms of because you're saving... Uh, to be captured or already captured organizations, there's a certain urgency to it. Does this kind of funding model also leave space for other kinds of media organizations, um, start startups, uh, non-profit organizations, or less urgency-focused um, publications? So, very good question, Patrice. 
So uh, earlier on, I, I mentioned two entities, Pluralis the vehicle and then MDIF. MDIF for 27 years has been, the, our track record is that our first criteria is the independence of the media. Most, yes, we are very driven as an NGO that has, uses financial tools to use those tools, but the first entry point is really or not whether the due diligence is whether you have any ethnical agenda, religious agenda. We have a whole list in 27 years behind us. Sorry. So that's the first criteria. And this in MDIF applies to the governance of pluralis. We would not launch pluralis if it did not abide to this mission driven logic. So that's the first entry point. So Pluralis is Council of Europe, 47 countries, but then reality kicks in. It's 100 million. What can we save and so forth? To answer your question about the typology, we are, there's two answers. The first is we are looking for um, outlets that are at risk of being captured or have been captured or also might have an impact on the future of the country. If you take the Balkans right now, it's difficult to buy a legacy media, TV and radio. But there are digital news outlets that actually play a very big role. They cover one story and suddenly everyone else, there comes a critical mass where that story has to be covered even by the government-owned organization. So I, I think th th that's... Finally, the, the second concrete answer I can give you is that there's really three buckets in pluralis in those 100 million. One bucket are large organizations, and um, I'll start with the medium one. The medium one are, are organizations that the entry into this organization will be in the order of five to 10 million. That is the case of SME, a very important outlet and the impact it has on Slovakia. The bigger first bucket goes around in the order of 20 million, and I should tell you that the second transaction, which is public, we stopped the capture by Orlen in gas, company, state-owned company in Poland, to buy uh, a Post Polita in Poland, which is the Wall Street Journal of Poland. I just want that to sink in. A gas company, state-owned, was going to own the conservative business audience of Poland. So uh, that's the first bucket, 20. And then finally, you're absolutely right. We believe that the future, including with what Kirsty is saying, belongs to the digital. So there will be another pocket, which will be much more smaller digital news outlet, in the logic that they will play in a preemptive way a role into media diversity in their country. Does that make sense? Thank you very, Thank you very much. Any other questions? <coughs> the lady in black at the back, please. Thank you. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Jelena Berkovic. I come from uh, Zagreb, Croatia, from uh, fact-checking media outlet uh, Faktograf, and very interested in your plans in Western Balkans. But let me just ask, being trained to death <laughs> and um, collaborated to death, and many of those um, opportunities that were offered by the European funds, I wonder if those European public funds could be used more efficiently and effectively in pluralis, perhaps? I, I wonder if that is a scenario to want or to be afraid of, having in mind that the European Media Freedom Act that is being discussed right now includes, even from the European Parliament uh, Committee on Culture, ideas and amendments such as the owners of uh, media service providers will keep the final right to be the editors-in-chief and decide on the editorial themes and editorial issues. So, um, basically, are you as worried as I am about what the EU is planning to do with regulating and funding um, independent media? Thank you. Yeah, well, that's more a question to me, I think, <laughs> than uh, uh, to the others on the panel. <clears throat> so, let me say that um, the purpose of the Media Freedom Act is to maintain the freedom of the media. We have to see how the negotiations are going in the European Parliament. Of course, there are political forces. I mean, you know, let's not kid ourselves, and they may be stronger even after the next election, who want to go in a direction of making it probably even easier uh, to have state capture or capture by tycoons because it's in their political interest. So this is a genuine political fight. And uh, those who have the worries like you have them, have to engage politically in this, not only by voting for the right political uh, forces in the next European elections, but also team up, get together, 
and work uh, the flaws of democracy. I have seen this happening often. You know, I mean, I was the lead director on GDPR, for example, and without the support of civil society, really in multinational groups, you know, one from Vienna, one from Poland, one from uh, uh, France, and, and, and so on, you know, they went along the floors of uh, the European Parliament and talked to the members to convince them and to explain to them what the issue was. This is what democracy is about. So I think your question uh, is right. It is a battle. The battle is not finished. The European Commission stands for wanting to increase the protection and independence of media. We are worried about what's happening in, to democracy in Europe, not only what's happening in Hungary and in Poland. We see trends in many member states of civil society space shrinking. We see trends of populism. We see trends of, you know, I could make a long list of negatives. But at the end, uh, all these legal acts uh, which are now going through the par uh, parliament to shape the future public space, and it's this, it's also the uh, legislation on the uh, transparency of election advertisement on the internet, it is the DSA uh, uh, and, and the AI Act and so on. All these pieces of legislation will in the end be a political compromise among the majorities which there are in the parliament. So, you know, that's all I can say and I can only call on you to get organized, to write papers, to make visits, to talk to your home government if you think you have an influence there because it's always co-decision. <coughs> Member states governments together in the council and members of uh, the European Parliament who represent the people. Both sides of the co-decision need to be worked and it's a battle and I'm telling you also the battle will not be over uh, with the next European election, but probably the battle will get more dramatic. Yeah. All the more so, it is important to have maybe an increasing mixed financing because politics will not solve all problems. This being said, I think it is important that um, this type of issue is raised and I, you know, I'm very honest about this. I've tried before to get organized journalists together or publishers together. That is the most difficult job in the world. You know, because they're all smart asses and individuals and you know, and what I'm saying is, you know, you got to get together and get organized together because only together you make a difference in, in politics. Okay, now I see a lot of hands. Can I, can I just add yes, something please, to course. this question? I think that the Media Freedom Act has uh, a lot of good intentions, but similarly as you, I am very concerned about the independence of national regulator, regulators and, and the, the fact that these national regulators should be controlling, keeping some of the provisions of the act, because I cannot imagine uh, Viktor Orban sending a truly independent person there. I cannot imagine uh, the, some of other uh, local autocrats. And I think that in this instance, EU should be more uncompromising in protecting its own values, because the lesson in Hungary has shown that, that uh, autocrats are very creative in, in, in uh, learning from each other, and already the media capture in Hungary has inspiring uh, wannabe autocrats in Slovakia, in Czech Republic, in Poland, and they are following Orban Viktor's steps. And, and I think that, that I'm not going to blame now the, the European Union for not taking more uh, rougher steps 10 years ago, but we have arrived to the point when there is no, uh, there is no space for compromising uh, media freedom anymore. There were two hands here on the right. Are you still uh, interested in to talk? Then please raise your hand so we can get you the microphone. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Rasmus Nelson from the Reuters Institute. Um, as Paul just described, there is a battle between those who like media capture and those who don't like it. So I'd just be curious to hear from those of you who represent new forms of investment, how do you see authoritarian governments react to your initiatives? I mean, we all know that people who took money from Very society question. foundations 15 years ago are still being subject to wild anti-Semitic trolling on the basis of that, and surely you expect the same thing to happen with your initiatives. So how, how do you see this playing out? 
Maybe I, I will start uh, that when Pluralis entered SME, uh, Robert Fitzel, the, the uh, really the former prime minister and, and at the time uh, uh, still like having uh, decisive power in the country, said that uh, a Soros fund is going now to influence Slovakia, referring to George Soros, uh, who has been elevated to a utmost enemy of by Viktor Orban and, and using it as really um, like a, the main narrative against liberalism. So, but, based, but there is a huge difference in, in being blamed uh, for being a Soros uh, child. And we know that it's, uh, for example, my colleagues are not really uh, caring about that. But I think that, that these governments are using disinformation and using propaganda to really uh, attack those investors. What about examples in other countries? Have you been, have governments tried to block you as an investor? Has there been a fight in Poland? What's, what's the story? Um, for, for just, just, I want to bounce, one, I will answer. So, another, so I wish I could tell you that the blended finance, we had the strategy sorted out from the beginning and then we actually discovered a lot of values as we moved in. And one of them, to answer your point, is that if you are a blended funded fund, you, can't, you, you can say and if, if, if the Soros Economic Development Fund has only 10% of you, and it literally happened in Poland when we took the shares into Grammy uh, Media, who owns Shares Post Polita, they literally said, it's Soros, it's Soros, it's Soros for 24 hours. And then suddenly, half brain people looked at the ownership and they said, wait, there, there's all this blended funding. We cannot honestly say that this is a source fund. So there's a value of blended funding, which I wish I could tell you there was our strategy from the beginning, but it's another value which I need to report here. Now, on the attack, so MDIF over 27 years has been, that's, our, that's pretty much our bread and butter, because if you do come into a country and you do help a if you do help a, a, a women and men who are working in organizations that are bringing the government to account, you will be attacked. And we've been attacked from our clients, which is most dangerous. It's not dangerous to us, it's dangerous to, we have now Jose Ruben Zamora in Guatemala, who is now in prison for now a year and a half, I believe. I, I think it's a year and a half. Uh, so the clients are attacked, but we are also attacked. Uh, we are, uh, I think I'm looking to my CEO to say if I can say this, but I think we are an undesirable organization in Russia, so that from foreign agents, you get, we got upgraded to undesirable organization, which means that any organization that has any link with us, and we did, and we did, so we had to change that completely, there was no subpoena and Im immediately criminal uh, uh, indictment with no appeal, if you were linked to an undesirable organization, which we are. Uh, it's one moment of my life when I'm proud of being undesirable. Yeah. <laughs> right, okay, we can take one more question, please. Thank you. Yes, I'm Tom Law from the Global Forum for Media Development. Uh, the description of being trained to death is one that we're familiar with and our members um, express their frustration at this all the time. So my question is, and this is not a new <laughs> phenomenon, this has been uh, complained about for years. So my question is, how do we move, change the behavior and what donors are more comfortable in funding? This is a, a great example and I've certainly been persuaded of its uh, effectiveness, but how do we take this conversation forward? How do we persuade other donors to change their behavior and change how they um, decide how to fund and how they're responsive to needs of organizations rather than coming with a, a pre-cooked um, project for a country which too often uh, could be described as capacity building or other such, um, other such words? I, <laughs> I think yeah, that should be a theme for the next session. <laughs> it's a great question and it's important to find answers to it. Mm. Yeah, but as far as the politically induced funding is from EU funds, I can tell you that never ever has the European Commission been so open for new ideas how to better support democracy. So, you know, my answer to your question as far as the political realm is concerned is build a coalition, get together, write a paper and influence the future commission after the European, after the European next elections 
because people are searching for ideas on how to support democracy in Europe, including through better structure of funding. Thank you very much uh, for the question. Thank you very much to the panel. Thank you.